Hello, Dr. Mastro. Welcome to this episode of Today on Wall Street. Uh, Dr. Mastro, we are so great to have you here today. But before we get started, can you first tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, how did your career path end up intersecting with the United States Indo-Pacific strategy? Well, that's a, a very interesting question. Uh, it was kind of a random occurrence. I uh, started out as an undergraduate at Stanford University, uh, interested in the arts, piano and drama in particular, but I always had a love of languages and spoke um, several romance languages, so I started learning Chinese. Uh, during the course of my undergraduate career, I took a year off, went to China for the year, and that's where I discovered what a dynamic and interesting and fascinating place uh, China was. I had up until that point, basically taking courses on Chinese history and literature. And, and when I returned to Stanford, uh, I enrolled in an honors program in international security. And that was my first exposure to military topics, of which I just had a real natural um, passion for. So I have been now it's been many years since then, I won't say exactly how many, but uh, I've just continued uh, my study of the Chinese military security policies through a PhD at Princeton, and then um, as an assistant professor at Georgetown, and now a center fellow at Stanford, as well as a non-resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, um, and uh, just being engaged in these topics are of such importance uh, to the United States, to the region, into the world. So um, I am, I'm happy to continue my research on these topics and I hope my research is useful. Fantastic, uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I wanted to turn to a recent commentary or analysis you published in Foreign Affairs. So I already got a chance to introduce that article to my audience a little bit and they are fascinated by it. Uh, in the article, you review that, um, you know, there have been disturbing signals that Beijing is actually contemplating armed unification with Taiwan. I wonder if you can elaborate a little more. What are, are those signals and why are they concerning? Well, I think there's a number of things uh, that have changed. And I started noticing these changes initially. I went to Beijing in October 2019 um, for a dialogue about Taiwan. And in that discussion, of course, everyone was talking about mainly peaceful reunification, maybe some course of methods, but not armed reunification. Um, but when I sort of pushed the issue, I said, you know, well, what if peaceful reunification doesn't work? Then what? And I said, well, then of course, it's armed reunification. And, and as a military specialist, I've seen that the Chinese military has been uh, designing its modernization primarily for invasion of Taiwan. Now, this isn't to say that they're going to do it, but it means it's their primary mission. So as I saw the politics change in Taiwan, right, it seems more and more the people of Taiwan are not going to agree to be a part of mainland China, I think, without boots on the ground. The Chinese government realizes this. Xi Jinping is now making more forceful statements about Taiwan. Now, many people might say, oh, you know, what he says doesn't matter. He can say whatever he wants. But I will tell you, as an analyst, looking at issues across the past two decades, what the Chinese government says is usually pretty in line with what they do. So, so I've had a good track record on this before, so I'm going to continue to use that discourse as a source. Coupled with that, we see the Chinese military for the first time might be able to do an amphibious landing. So they've done these major reforms with a sense of urgency, which you also have to ask yourself, like, why was Xi Jinping so set on, you've got to get this done by 2020? If there was no timeline, um, and and now they can conduct joint operations, and they they introduce a new joint sort of strategic guidelines in November of 2020. Mm -hmm. So they're very focused on being able to do this militarily, um, and in my mind, that's the only way this is going to happen. A lot of American strategists think. China will never do this because it's so costly for them. But I think there's a lot of U.S. mirror imaging happening, um, assuming that the Chinese think about things the way we do. In my discussions with the Chinese military, others in the country, uh, I don't think they see the costs the same way that we do. Gotcha. So the benefits are high. Uh, the abilities are there. The costs are decreasing. Uh, and so I think, like the article says, I don't say it's 100 percent going to happen, but I think the temptation is there. Gotcha, gotcha. And, you know, I wanted to turn to sort of the thinking within the Chinese leadership a little bit. In the article and also to Congress, you review that, you know, based on your conversations with a China analysts and also Chinese officials, even moderate voices in their leadership have admitted that not only are calls for armed unification proliferating within the leadership, but also they themselves have recommended military actions to senior Chinese leadership. 
So what do you make of it? And what's your explanation for this change in attitude uh, within the leadership? Well, the first thing I'll say is, you know, many strategists look at, you know, what is being said, what is being written very differently. You know, some people might look at frequency, like how many articles are there about armed reunification versus peaceful reunification. I really think looking at how the debate evolves is, is of primary importance, right? Sometimes you see articles now that just say, you know, we assume armed reunification is going to happen. How, how should we go about it? There's no longer as much of a debate about is peaceful reunification the way to go. There's kind of an assumption that's not the way to go is to armed reunification. I'll also say that in the Chinese system, you know, it's not like they can write about anything. It's not like you can just, you know, no one's writing that Taiwan shouldn't be a part of China, for example, right? There's a limit to what is condoned. And so it seems like the more we see these very blatant sort of descriptions of, you know, peace reunification isn't working, we need to start using the military, we can do it. That to me is, is a clear signal. You know, why has this changed? Countries have national interests. All countries do. Uh, and one of the main constraining factors on China has been the ability to pursue these interests, right? Just limitations on their power. And as they've become more and more powerful, they have uh, tried to leverage uh, every aspect of that power to basically pave the way to being able to reunify with Taiwan at lower cost. So one of the examples I give in the paper is they have these strategic partnership agreements that basically convince countries and also organizations, they have one with the European Union, for example, that they should prioritize the economic relationship over Taiwan. Right. Of course, these are not binding. But what it's saying is that, you know, these countries are saying, yes, we agree that Taiwan is a unique situation. However you deal with Taiwan is kind of your business. We want the economic relationship. Um, and so they're they're setting the stage for, you know, being able to do things at a lower cost. So, you know, big countries don't like other countries to determine their policies. You know, a lot of people, um, U.S. strategists, for example, can define national security as being free from foreign dictation. So that's what China wants too. China wants to be able to do whatever it wants without other countries being able to influence or constrain it. Um, and, uh, you know, that's logically makes sense. But as an American strategist, that is a goal of theirs that I'm trying to ensure they do not reach. Gotcha. And speaking of timeline, as you know, um, Admiral Philip Davidson uh, warned senators a, a while ago that Beijing could decide to try to seize control of Taiwan by force by 2027. So that's pretty urgent. But in the event of an attack, so what will such an invasion actually look like? What kind of tactics or campaigns will Beijing deploy and in what order? Can you please walk us through the steps? So there are four main campaigns that Beijing is planning for. There's a joint missile campaign, which is basically, you know, firing missiles on key targets within Taiwan to force a, a capitulation, a political capitulation. There's a blockade. There is a counter intervention in which they're attacking U.S. bases in the region, other U.S. assets to prevent the ability of the United States to intervene effectively. And then there's the amphibious landing, right, which they are actually physically taking their troops, going over and controlling Taiwan. Now, I think most military strategists agree that they can do the first three. The last one, the amphibious landing, there is some debate, you know, of whether they can do it. And and a lot of the whether they can do it is mostly, is focused on cost. It's not that they won't be able to do it. It's how costly it is. Now, I personally don't think that's much of a deterrent for China. Others might think so. So there's these four campaigns. Some people argue they'll start at these lower levels of coercion, you know, like maybe some psychological warfare, some missiles. You know, there are benefits to that if you can get capitulation without, you know, a full-blown war. My personal view is I don't think that the people of Taiwan are going to completely give up, um, you know, all their whole, their whole way of life um, because of that, especially because the United States will come to their aid. So I do think the amphibious landing is really necessary from the Chinese perspective to do this. Also, there's a downside because the gradual approach gives the United States time to respond. And most of the scenarios in which the United States potentially loses to China are because the United States doesn't have enough time to respond. And the Chinese know this, that they have to move quickly. So there is a downside to, you know, doing things slowly, like a blockade or, you know, things that are, are predicated on the capitulation of Taiwan, because that gives the United States ample time to flow resources into the region. And then, and then China's victory is much less assured. So in my own view, I think it largely depends on what they think the United States is going to do. Ironically, if they think 100% the United States will defend Taiwan, I think they're going to they're gonna go for the hitting the United States amphibious landing immediately. It's going to be very quick. 
very quick escalation. If they're unsure, then they're not going to want to bring the United States in. So then maybe you'll see a more gradual approach. I see. I see. And speaking of the role of the United States, um, recently a piece of news really took me by surprise, which is, you know, during those simulated combats by, by Pentagon, also by uh, Rand Corporation, when America is facing off against China, the U.S. side often loses. So what's the explanation for that? And how did the U.S. lose its military edge over China, especially when it comes to Taiwan? Right. So there's two different things. You know, has the United States lost its military edge versus will it lose uh, in a situation in Taiwan? The United States military is far superior to the Chinese military across the board in many different areas. But the problem is sort of twofold. The first is in this specific Taiwan situation, right, the nearest part of that strait is like 80 miles. It's very close to mainland China. So China can rely on a lot of capabilities that are within China that the United States, you know, can't, for example. If you just think about air defense systems along their coasts, you know, that covers a lot of the water. Those are much more powerful than a ship-based air defense system, for example. And the United States is trying to project power from very far away. So it's also what we're trying to accomplish. In some cases, China can, all they have to do is delay the U.S. response. They don't have to beat the United States military. They just have to delay the U.S. response. And so there are very low cost ways of doing this now that most militaries are very, you know, networked, informationalized, right? You can blind satellites. You can disrupt, you know, cy through cyber means, disrupt computers. So the, those scenarios, it's not the case that the United States always loses. What the concern is, is there are now situations under which the United States might lose. Those scenarios are usually ones in which, you know, the United States doesn't get a lot of warning. China moves very quickly. And then we find ourselves in this difficult political situation if the war is over, right? No one is fighting anyone. Will a U.S. president fire a shot at China? Like that becomes, so it's not operationally difficult. There's some kind of strategic political uh, obstacles to kind of restarting a war that's already over. So in that scenario, yes, if everything goes right for China, um, if they take out U.S. bases, for example, the United States can't operate against them. The United States needs time to move forces into the region. China could take Taiwan by that time. Um, and so this is what's concerning to U.S. planners. Uh, the United States likes to have like full assured victory in all scenarios. And with Taiwan, we no longer have that. That's not the case, for example, with South China Sea scenarios, where the United States still largely has an advantage. I see, I see. And I wanted to turn to sort of the political wills of Xi Jinping a little bit. And you briefly alluded to some aspects of that. I think in the foreign affairs article, you argue that once China has the military capabilities to solve its Taiwan problem, Xi Jinping could find it politically untenable not to do so. So can you tell us a little more? What are Xi Jinping's political deliberations when it comes to the Taiwan issue? So I, I've never met Xi Jinping. I don't know his internal workings. But, but what I do know is that, you know, 80% of conflicts are over territory. That since, you know, if you look at conflicts since the 1800s, leaders have always prioritized territory over economics, over other things. Um, and that uh, Xi Jinping, is Xi Jinping going to be the outlier in that? That's the question I ask myself. Like, is he much more risk averse than all these previous leaders? And as we've seen him on the international stage, interactions with other countries, even the role of the military, the Chinese military in the region has expanded. It doesn't, if I had to place my bets, it's not on Xi Jinping being more risk averse, more cautious, and more averse to war than the average leader. Um, I think he, if he's going to fall somewhere in the spectrum, it's probably he's more risk acceptant, more confident. And then if we go with the trends, you know, if, if, if leaders come to him and they say, we can do this, we can do it at, at an acceptable cost. Do you want to be the leader that resolves this Taiwan issue once and for all? I think it's going to be, you know, he has said it's tied to the China dream and China rejuvenation, his main platforms. I think it'd be very difficult for him to say no. I see, I see, I see. And finally, I wanted to turn to some more recent news and ask for your comments on those. First, this special operator is training Taiwanese troops. Um, as you know, Christopher Meyer recently said uh, special operators could potentially help Taiwanese troops to, to train and to fend off PLA 
uh, aggression. And since then, we've heard from uh, Taiwanese me uh, media outlets saying that multiple U.S. Special Force Forces units were to arrive and train with their Taiwanese counterparts, also citing military sources. So what's going on there? Uh, how should or, how, or will uh, U.S. Special Forces train their Taiwanese counterparts and will it help and in what way? So I think this is based on a U.S. assumption, which which I think is incorrect, but it, it, it's a U.S. line of argument that, um, oh, the, the invasion isn't the problem, it's the occupation. That China trying to occupy Taiwan will be extremely difficult and costly to them. Now, first of all, this is like complete mirror imaging based on the U.S. experiences with Iraq and Afghanistan. The United States has had various difficulties there. But they don't, they don't apply to China with Taiwan because China does not you know, find it necessary to follow international law and other types of humane treatments when they're trying to deal with internal issues. The Chinese military has not fought a war since 1979. So the landing is the hard part. They have, they spend more on internal repression than they do on the military. They have ample experience dealing with populations. You know, there, there are more people's armed police, arguably, than there are young men in Taiwan. Right. So my personal view is, you know, yes, the United States might try to help Taiwan make this more costly for Beijing. But in the end, if, if the PLA can get boots on the ground in Taiwan, they're not going home. And, and even if you do have, you know, special operators, saboteurs, um, you know, increase the costs for that military occupation, uh, you know, China's pretty brutal in how they deal with those sorts of things. And so PLA writings, they don't discount that there could be those types of issues, but they basically say, like, that's the easy part. I think that's how they view it, um, which it sounds kind of dark, but I think that's how the, the Chinese are thinking about those costs. So so we can do what we can to increase the costs, um, but unless we can uh, make it so they could potentially not land, that they question their ability to succeed in that operation, I don't think it's going to be enough to deter them. I see. And then the question is, what should the United States do? Um, what options does the United States have to deter Xi Jinping from actually, you know, landing on Taiwan, which is sort of the hard part? So there's in the article, I talk about putting a lot of missiles in the second island chain. I mean, the bottom line is China has is very resolved and has more resolve on the Taiwan issue than the United States does. So it really has to be a question of no matter how resolved they are, they can't physically do it. So if the, if, if the United States is raining missiles down in the straits, so they can't physically get ships over. Like they're not they're not going to do it. Another thing I didn't mention in the article, though, that I think is important, is the role of allies and partners. A lot of the um, disadvantages the United States has has to do with you know the fact that we're projecting power from very far away. You know, if Japan fought this war with the United States, then then China could not win right now, given the balance of power, right? So these are obviously very hypothetical. You know, Japan is, is, is very much against any sort of offensive combat support of the United States. But, you know, these are the types of things if the Chinese thought, okay, we were, we were going to have to fight the Japanese and the United States, which basically that, that window of possibilities of victory becomes very, very, very small, if not non-existent. And, and in that case, unless Taiwan declares independence or something forces China to react, they're, go, they're, they're not going to, to invade. They're, they're basically going to try to wait to try to shift the balance of power you know, in their interest again before they move. So I think we can continue to delay this. People always say, well, you know, at what point? You know, the world can change, right? Like, did we any of expect COVID? Like, no, there can be technological improvements that, that help the United States project power uh, more efficiently. There can be leadership changes in China. I mean, we just don't know. So I think we can't prevent China from considering armed reunification, you know, a full stop. The best we can do is delay it and hope that some major structural changes happen. And, and in that case, I think it really is about the United States' abil military's ability to stop them or to threaten their rejuvenation in that if, if, the, if the Chinese believe that all U.S. partners and allies would no longer trade with them indefinitely, if they use force against Taiwan, they wouldn't do it. The problem is I don't think the Chinese believe that. I don't think they believe that because allies and partners are probably unwilling to make that type of commitment. Um, but these are the types of policies the United States should be pursuing. 
Fantastic. And final question of the day. This actually comes from in one of our audience. As you know, the U.S. Air Force uh, C-17 cargo plane made a three-hour stopover in Taipei on Sunday, carrying a bipartisan delegation of senators. But it was actually the first C-17 visit since at least 1995. So what do you make of it? Does, does the fact that the United States deployed C-17 to Taiwan uh, make any difference? Is it important? What's your take on that? Well, I can't say anything specifically about the platform, but what I can say is that I think it's important to increase Taiwan's international space. This gets to the rejuvenation of the costs issue. I think for the most part, China has been trying to convince countries to stay out of the issue. I think they think they've been relatively successful in that. Um, the more countries do engage with Taiwan, the more China might think that there would be broader international costs associated with that invasion. And because I don't think China is going to move unless they are confident they will succeed. The second thing I'll mention is I don't think these types of visits are dangerous or provocative in any way. It's not going to be the case that because the United States has a delegation to Taiwan, then China attacks Taiwan. Like, you know, this is this is their first operation since 1979. It is a difficult operation. It is obviously very emotional. They don't want to fail. They're not going to be pushed into it by some of these lower level things. And so I would say that, you know, whatever the United States can do to to increase Taiwan's international space, the U.S. ties with Taiwan, as well as Taiwan's ties with other countries, um, there's only deterrence benefits in that. And it's not going to provoke a, a conflict. So it's good to see more of those types of activities. Well, we also have to simultaneously reassure Beijing that the U.S. policy is not Taiwan independence. Um, the more we inter you know, engage with Taiwan, there might be concerns in Beijing that the United States has changed its stance. So we also have to be very proactive at reassuring Beijing that the U.S. policy is still you know, preference for the status quo on both sides of the street. Gotcha. And thank you so much for all the insights. It's been such a helpful conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Mastrel. It's been great talking to you, and I look forward to talking with you in the future. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.